Hey everybody, what up? All right, so what I'm going to be talking about in this video is what does it take to be a senior developer in my experience, uh, or from my perspective, really, and this is based on my own experience, 15 plus years of doing this, and a lot of people say that your job is going to be taken pretty soon by AI, and I just don't think that that's accurate. Uh, so some of the things that if we jump in, and we're really going to look at this from a web development perspective, which is where my expertise lie. My latest side project is going to be a video game that I'm working on in Unreal Engine, but I'm a web developer. I've always been a web developer pretty much my entire career, but it spans a lot of different things. So jumping right in, you got HTML, CSS, JavaScript, which is like the backbone of all web development. However, you don't do anything in just these three technologies anymore. So if you're going to learn how to do this, you start with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, in my opinion. Now, once you get into JavaScript, you're going to realize that uh, there's a whole lot of JavaScript out there in the world, and really nobody's writing JavaScript anymore. It's TypeScript. So TypeScript is being used all over the place. So once you introduce TypeScript into your learning repertoire, you're really going to learn about uh, types and typecasting and, and having everything type safe, unless you configure it to basically behave as if it was JavaScript, but you're never going to see that in the wild. <clears throat> Actually, you might, but then you probably are working at a shop that has uh, probably no idea what they're doing. Um, so that said, those four technologies right there are going to take you some time in order to master. Um, so I'll just kind of brush over a lot of this stuff here and not go into detail on any one of them. Once you start moving into those four elements, uh, then you really have to start looking at how do I style my stuff? So a lot of people are using Tailwind CSS these days, which I still don't like, and I actually do not condone. Uh, but other other than Tailwind, I mean, you have SAS that's still dominating. So I think most shops are still using SAS. So point being is that there's a lot of CSS that is being written out there, but a lot of that CSS is written in SAS. Um, and then you have less, and you might run into some of that older stuff as well. But uh, all that said, so then once you start feeling comfortable with that, then you realize that you can't really do too much in your ecosystem when it comes to dynamically driven uh, user interfaces. So what does that mean? It means data changes, and instead of your whole page refreshing, you want just a certain piece of your page to uh, make that update. So a lot of technology goes on behind the scenes in order to do that. And the three biggest frameworks that we have out there for client side, meaning that it is developed for browsers, although all these things now exist on the server side, that's something you might want to spend some time learning. It takes forever, I think, um, when you're just getting started. But uh, React was initially built as a client side view library, and it's grown from there. Uh, but ultimately, the three frameworks, Angular and Vue, uh, that seem to dominate UI development, component-based development, uh, they were all initially created for dynamically driven UIs. So you could spend a whole lot of time in any one of these fields to try to get up to speed. Uh, now, when people talk about ChatGPT taking your job, in my opinion, if all you know is React, then yes, there's a possibility that your job can end up becoming obsolete as some of these code completion tools get better and better. Now, moving on, once you get past that, you need to actually house your website somewhere where people can see it. So most corporations, instead of having to maintain uh, humongous cost centers for having on-premises servers like we used to do back in the day, like IBM mainframes, we've now technology locked ourselves into other people's servers. So they still do the same thing, but instead of it being on-premises for your company, you're paying for AWS or Microsoft Azure uh, or some of the lesser known companies like Linode who just got bought, which pisses me off. Uh, but you're paying for that um, so another company can do all of that, that headache for you. However, then you have to play by all their rules and you lock yourself into their technologies and you pay the price. Um, when it comes to uh, eventually uh, just a few dominant players in this market. And AWS has, I think, 55% right now. So when you look at AWS and you're like, hey, what kind of server do I want to build? You could spend a career in their products. I mean, there's things that you have to know, like cloud formation, build pipelines, EC2 instances, API gateway, uh, AWS Lambda, uh, 
There's a million different ways that you can design your application, secrets manager, parameter store. There, there's a lot of different products within AWS that, like I said, you could spend a ton of time doing. And some people's career is simply just simply, uh, you know, AWS piping. But you don't have to use AWS. You could use Azure, and it's a similar story. You could use Google Cloud, uh, and that's a similar story. You could go with a lesser-known product um, like Linode, like I do. But then that also has its own learning curve because then what you're dealing with is a virtual machine. So you have to learn how virtual machines work. You have to learn how to SSH into your virtual machine uh, from your computer. You need to write scripts to transfer files from your computer to your server, or you could use GUI tools like FileZilla or something of that effect. Uh, but they're slow, and um, there's a learning curve to every one of those tools. You also, when you start getting serious about your project, you need to be able to have version control, and that's where Git comes in. So Git is the dominant factor in version control. We used to have things called uh, Perforce and uh, a couple of other products and things, but we've been using Git for the longest time now. So when it comes to Git, you have to learn about commits and pushes and rebases and merging and code conflicts and a ton of other things that are involved in Git and uh, and certainly branching and all of that stuff. So with Git, though, it doesn't just exist in isolation. So most people are putting their product in some sort of cloud-based thing. So most people use GitHub. That's housing most of these personal projects. Uh, and also now corporations have used uh, GitHub quite a bit. So there's a lot of private repos within GitHub that people are using. Um, so all that said, you have to um, have your Git working on your local machine. You also have to have a Git somewhere in the cloud, whether it's Azure or something else, um, or GitHub, GitLab, any of those, Bitbucket. You're going to put your code somewhere in the cloud, and that also ensures that you can have cross-team collaboration, so multiple people could be working from around the world, and you could all be pushing to the same code base. Now, once you start talking about multiple different people, that's where you start to have agile methodologies come into play. So agile methodologies, there's a lot to that, but Essentially, you have teams of developers, and they're called scrum teams, and those scrum teams have a process in place that there's now jobs like Agile Coach, uh, which is, is crazy, Scrum Master, uh, Project Manager, Project Owner, QA, Quality Assurance Testing, Software Engineering, User Experience Designers, all of that could be on your scrum team. And then there's an entire process involved when you're talking about dealing with agile. So maintaining that agile workflow is typically done in software such as Jira and Jira here gives you um, some, what, what these are, or these are um, work items or work tickets, um, user stories. They could be of different types. So um, <clears throat> when you're dealing with agile methodology, you got sprints and, uh, sprints are to develop some sort of an epic, and epic are broken down uh, into multiple sprints, and sprints have different user stories, bugs, tasks, subtasks. And then we have things like story pointing, so we use products like poker, pl uh, planning poker, and other story pointing feature uh, products out there to help us try to come up with an arbitrary number of how complicated a particular task is going to be. So that way you can break your task down into smaller tasks and hopefully get things done in a much more efficient way. And then most importantly, for companies to have a track record of their productivity. Another thing that is, uh, I think, common within software engineering is that you have to be good at reading, writing, and communicating technical uh, difficulties and techn having te technical conversations with people that are of not uh, a technical mind. So as a senior engineer, you're typically not just talking to other engineers. You're talking to product managers and sometimes just simply business analysts or business executives. And you're trying to explain something, why some you know, technology is going to be difficult to implement or a million different things you have to explain in regards to just simply web programming in general. And you have to do that in a way that makes sense to them. And they don't know about Ajax calls and, and server side versus client side. And like, you know, there's a very vague understanding there. So 
being able to dis- to to have a technical conversation uh, with non technical people is an actual skill, and um, and a lot of that does involve actually writing out documents. So when we're writing out documents, it could be to products like uh, Confluence, which is owned by Atlas and as well, which owns Jira, or you could be writing Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, um, Excel spreadsheets. A lot of that in the Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft uh, Office products. Um, but then there's also Google Docs and Google Slides and all that too. So that you're not just simply using Microsoft products, but they now work cross platform. Um, that also means that there's multiple ways of communicating. So these days we're communicating instant messenger, but not every communication should be done via instant messenger. Sometimes our communication is done through email, uh, whether it's Outlook or something else, or even Gmail. Um, sometimes it's more, you know, it's, it's necessary to have email conversations. Other times it's better to have a Slack conversation. Sometimes it's conversations that are occurring on Jira work tickets and understanding when and where those uh, conversations should be had is also somewhat of a skill. So uh, these are just tools that you're going to see in every workplace. So if, if they're not using Slack, typically they're using Microsoft Teams. The next thing is that in order to actually have a good working process, um, there's something called continuous integration, continuous development. And this is a methodology that says, basically, if I push something into um, my repository, there's gonna be a bunch of checks and balances in place to make sure I'm not gonna screw up the entire code base. So those tests uh, and that pipeline, it consists of a lot of different things, but typically what it's looking at, it's running your code through things like ESLint. Um, And ESLint is uh, a product that simply looks at the way that you coded things. So did you add extra new lines? Did you not put a semicolon? Just Even though your code uh, compiles and runs, it doesn't mean that it's written in any sort of good way. So linting tools allow us to to create standards across teams and then run the code against those linters to make sure that you're following all the rules and regulations that are put in place. Typically, if you have a good CI CD pipeline, that is going to be automated. So as soon as you go and try to commit your code, those checks will be running and tell you if there is a problem. Um, CI CD again it consists of pipelines and their jobs you can see that there's stages so there's in most uh, environments that you're going to work in in a corporate world you don't just push your stuff into prod once it's been code reviewed so that's another skill as well that being able to read somebody else's code is a lot more difficult than writing your own even reading your own code six months later is more difficult than when you wrote it Um, so being good at, at reading people's code and finding, uh, you know, improper patterns or duplicated code and um, simple, you know, compilation errors even. Like you'll find sometimes people don't even run their code (laughs) and submit it for PR uh, and code review. And um, all that said, that is its own skill. But uh, you don't just push your code when it's checked by developers and it looks good and you merge it into your main code base. You don't just simply push that into prod unless you're insane. Um, so there's different levels of development. So a lot of times there's like, uh, different development environments. And then you have what are called like staging environments, which are much closer to prod. And then if everything checks out there, then you go to prod. Um, so those are all part of the pipeline process where you can set up your pipeline to run your linting tools. Uh, and then also to make sure that your code is tested and that your assertions are correct. So there's something called unit testing, and for React, uh, Jest is a common way that we do unit testing. But you should also know the difference between like unit testing and integration testing, and then end-to-end testing. And they're all different, but for unit testing, Jest is a popular library, uh, at least for web development, specifically React. And then when you're talking about uh, integration uh, testing, then something like Cypress is good. This is built off of Selenium, and I guess now it's Chromium and Puppeteer and other products that have now created this Cypress. But um, you could write these automated tests that are really going to pull up your browser, interact with your components, and make sure that they're behaving in the way that they're supposed to. Because unit tests don't actually simulate the working environment, which is components existing and working inside of a browser. <clears throat> 
in addition to all this, um, you probably need to understand HTTP, and this is really in no particular order at this point, but you know, HTTP sounds like such a basic thing. It's been around since, what, the 70s, but it is, um, there's a lot to it. You need to know about uh, HTTP caching. How do you prevent your browser from caching your JavaScript files? What are the different ways of doing that? You could use time timestamps. Uh, you could set headers from uh, your server that is responding and sending down the JS to tell the browser not to cache it. Uh, and um, you could also use just simply like query string version names and such, uh, which is similar to the timestamping. But you should also know about HTTP cookies. What is a HTTP only cookie, uh, also known as a server side only cookie or server side cookie? Uh, what, what are other ways that you could store client side data in a web browser, session storage, local storage? Those are things that you're going to end up uh, coming across for sure in the web development world. In addition to HTTP, though, it's uh, it's really about RESTful services these days. So we used to have SOAP-based services passing a bunch, bunch of XML back and forth. And um, these days, it's mostly RESTful APIs, single-page apps communicating with RESTful endpoints. Those endpoints are... Pretty much for every web development, you got CRUD applications, create, read, update, and delete. So there's different API methods for those. So what is the difference between a get and a post? When should you do a get and a post? Uh, how do you pass data to your API endpoint? How do you manage sessions when you have a stateless API? Um, how do you deal with authentication and authorization? What are the differences between authentication and authorization? This this list could go on and on, but essentially when you're dealing with RESTful architecture, there's a whole lot more there than I think meets the eye for a lot of people. When I talk about SOAP-based services and XML and XPath, uh, which I prefer over regular expressions, but I used to actually scrape the web and scrape HTML with just regular expressions using Perl. That's how I got my start in this game. Um, but regular expressions are still a commonly used thing, so we use that to verify that that the text that you're giving makes sense so if you're giving a phone number that it's in the right format or if it's an address or if it's a name if it's title case like regular expressions can test all this written language and um, tell you whether or not it passes or not and a simple boolean does this pass or not can do a lot and that gets into like boolean logic and maybe object-oriented programming uh, factory patterns procedural versus functional versus um uh you know object oriented programming though there's like are there's articles on that stuff there's differences between them all like it, it there, there's a ton there's a ton to learn <laughs> um but on top of all this what about databases right sql goes back to the 1970s so it's pretty important that you're going to end up interacting with a database at some point most databases whether it's postgres mysql any relational database that exists out there are typically in sql so you have to know how to write sql stored procedures are, are a lot of fun uh, depending on how complicated your database schema is and i mentioned all this stuff because i've had to deal with all this stuff throughout my career so it goes on. So I actually prefer NoSQL. So for my CodeHawk website, I use MongoDB, and I just like NoSQL. And then you got like DynamoDB with an AWS cloud. Uh, so for me, I prefer NoSQL these days versus SQL. But what are the differences? And when you're dealing with relational data, uh, that's very strict. Um, dealing with database migrations and such, that's usually why I just typically go with MongoDB. But um, NoSQL isn't the answer to everything, though. So even though you can do something in NoSQL, SQL itself, relational databases themselves may make more sense. Also, when you're dealing with anything, um, whether, like, so I, I've worked in Windows um, environments. There's a Windows machine that I'm recording this on. Uh, but on top of that, I've uh, written code using Mac. Uh, so I've been using Mac, uh, you know, Linux. So it, it's been not Linux, but it's, it's Unix based, but it's, um, it's very similar to like, to a Linux based system. And for Linux, I've used Ubuntu for quite a while. I say quite a while, meaning 10 plus years. And, um, and I've been writing code, uh, for work on a Mac for the last five years. 
So I really love the Mac when I, when I compare it to the Windows machine, but Windows still does a lot of what I want to do for a personal computer, especially when it comes to like game development um, or just simply having software that's guaranteed to run. I mean, Windows is still like the, the number one operating system when it comes to writing software that'll work for the majority of the users. Uh, but all that said, there are things called bash, right? So ZSH, uh, this GNU bash, knowing bash is, um, and also if you're on Windows and PowerShell, but these command line tools, um, these SSH tools uh, or SH scripts, they can do a whole lot. I mean, I, I've written scripts that, that can pull from you know databases and, and pull from uh, just GitHub and such and do merges and, and uh, move files around having to set configs and such. A lot of that is done in the bash. Also, when you're setting up your own virtual machine and you're having to install tools like Nginx uh, or Apache or something like that, then you're going to end up having to, to understand uh, bash and, and being able to write that efficiently allows you to go in and act like a ninja when it comes to like logging into your server and, and, uh, and doing stuff. Cause like, for instance, all my, uh, my Linode stuff, there is no user interface there. There's no Ubuntu uh, user interface. I have a Ubuntu operating system, but there's no interface, uh, user interface anyway. So everything is done via the command line. So my entire CodeHawk website is done via the command line. Um, and that said, if you're learning the code, check out my website, codehawk.com. I got a bunch of courses here. I'm going to be adding more eventually. Um, I, I've sort of taken off the last six months, but there's a lot there. I worked pretty hard on this for six months or so, made quite a bit of money, uh, in, in that effort. And, um, it could be a lot better and I plan on it being a lot better, but honestly, like, I just don't care that much. I mean, I do care, but I just not enough. It's not my bread and butter. Um, so moving on, once you have all that information in place, what about user experience design, making sure that you're using the right colors, the contrast, making, uh, are your buttons rounded? Uh, do you have a button or should you be using a link? Um, how should you format the, the sentences? Like here, I would say this is a very good paragraph structure. It's left aligned. You could, uh, justify center on these things. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, different font families. All that is considered user experience. How good does your website look? How how well does it behave? How intuitive is it for a human to come in and start using it? And on top of, I would say, user experience design, there's also something called web accessibility. So that's something that a lot of people don't spend enough time with. But if you're a large company like Domino's Pizza got sued for not having their website accessible for people that were blind, and also Netflix got um, sued for people that were deaf um, because when Netflix was around 10 years ago, they didn't even have closed caption. Uh, and now they have, they have that for every uh, movie. But the reason why is because of a big class action lawsuit because their web was, uh, their website was not accessible. So uh, there are people with different, uh, um, and, deficiencies or whatever or not deficiencies but uh blind deaf whatever can they use your website so if you're blind you have things like screen readers so that means you should have the right tags like images should have um, title tags or really alt tags to describe what the image is um, you should have title tags sometimes have um, uh, hover you know tool tips and such where needed uh, but there's a lot in web accessibility and you can use chrome tools to um, deal with uh, web accessibility and kind of rank your website. That brings up another point, like learning how Chrome developer tools works, whether you're going to use Firefox or Chrome, most people are using Chrome, but there's a, a ton of information in here, your elements, your, your HTML, CSS, JavaScript inside the page itself. Console, you could write JavaScript right in here and start uh, debugging, but you'll also see error messaging here. And then you have like your network panel, which is where all the HTTP requests are coming from. So you have to look at all these. How do you reverse reverse engineer this stuff? How do you understand it? This is a JavaScript file. This little piece on the end is probably something that is uh, like time stamping or, or creating it so it'll prevent caching. What is status code three or four even? Um, so status codes 200, 500, 404, they all mean stuff and they mean different things. Uh, then you have developer experience, right? So this is really like, in my opinion, uh, 
what is your development experience like? Does it take 15 minutes to compile your application? I've worked on projects within the .NET ecosystem that literally took like eight minutes for my computer to compile it. I once worked on this terrible application that had to recompile because it was using all these different assemblies every time you changed HTML, CSS, or JavaScript and like had this big whole server-side compilation. How that ever passed, how any architect was ever able to get that into a corporation is still beyond me. Uh, I don't actually work there anymore. Thank God. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is like, when you're dealing with networking, there's like firewalls, right? So I, when I set up my Linode server, my virtual private server uh, on Ubuntu, I have to set up my own firewall rules and everything. I don't have everything just listening on port you know, tw 22 or port 80 or whatever. Um, there are specific, well, I do have things listening on port 80 because that's typically your, your standard pass-through traffic. But um, setting up like reverse proxies, making sure that there, there could be no open ports that could be listening for attackers to come in and start uh, connecting with, with services that have open ports and such. Uh, locking that stuff down is what firewalls are for. There's a whole career that could be made for network security and all of that. When we talked about user experience design, a lot of that is actually done these days in tools like Figma where they're creating how the user interface is gonna look. It used to be like just Photoshop images, but now the tools are a lot better for cross-team collaboration. And a lot of your design requirements are in tools like Figma. In addition to Figma, you also have stuff like um, UML diagrams. So UML diagrams are typically created when you're writing out an architectural diagram of how is it that your website's gonna work? What do they have to interact with? Are they interacting with an email server? Uh, or calling this API to get this piece of data and then doing something with it and calling that, or if this, do that. Like all of that stuff should be documented and laid out, and Miro is a good product in order to do that. And that tells not just yourself or your team, but also management, other teams, how they can just quickly look at your Miro diagram and figure out how your stuff is architected so they don't have to go through your code base and slog through that. And um, it's just better to make sure your stuff is documented. Uh, documented. The next thing is like data transfer. So I talked about XML before, but everybody's using JSON now. So everything is JSON. Like uh, React, Angular, Vue all works with JSON data objects. And the way that this was created, I think it was uh, what, uh, Douglas Crockford, was that him? Uh, anyway, he wrote a JavaScript book, famous. JavaScript object notation is what this um, stands for. And um, essentially though, it is just key value pairs, right? Key value pairs and the values could be other objects and they can contain arrays and um, strings and anyway, you can have numbers in there as well. But it's a very fast, efficient way of transferring data. It's also easy to be parsed. And then that really brings me to the fact that this is going on for nearly 30 minutes now, but Node.js uh, is everywhere. Have it installed on your machine. You're gonna use it. It's how people compile their TypeScript these days. It's how most web applications are created. And then also NPM is built with it. So you could use Yarn or NPM. But what are package managers? Should you be using JFrog? Should you be using just NPM? Uh, NPM versions of packages, NPM scripts. Um, NPM and Node work hand in hand and things get quite a bit complicated. And then when you add tools like uh, Webpack. So like Webpack is still king of the block when it comes to bundling your projects and all of that stuff. And then in addition to Webpack, you have probably Vite that is a pretty good alternative, but they've replaced tools like Gulp, um, Grunt. What was the one with the parrot on it? I don't, anyway, all these tools that we don't use anymore. It's Webpack or Vite. And then ES Build actually, ES Build's a new kid on the block too. But um, ultimately though, all those tools can coexist and you can have a project that uses all of them. And I've just named just some of the technology that we deal with day to day as a senior engineer in this field. So yeah, good luck with uh, GPT-4 taking the job. I got a video on GPT-4 that couldn't even do a basic CRUD application of just simply log in, log out on an express based website. It made mistakes five times. I don't have time for that shit. Like I know how this thing works. Um, even if you get to a point where this could write code it's going to be an efficient tool for people that know how this technology works and how it plays together. And for people that know, they're still gonna be better than the tool.
because they're going to use the tool to become better. So that's really my honest opinion behind it. I, I think, you know, times are changing. There's going to be jobs replaced from it. If coders go, pretty much everybody else is going too. Uh, but if you're a good coder, you could always code the output. So that's really all I got. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. Appreciate it. And I'll try to start making more videos soon. All right. Thank you. Bye.